week one of life science, a whole new unit, classification. Um, so classification at its root is basically organizing. Classify and describe living things. Have you ever picked a dune head clock? Scattered the seeds of a swine snout? Rubbed a lion's tooth on your chin? Perhaps even made a necklace of stink davy? Most likely you have. These are all names of a common flower, the dandelion. Many living things have dozens of names depending on where they're found. The mountain lion, also known as the puma, cougar, and catamount, holds the Guinness World Record for animal with the most names. 40. How do scientists from different parts of the world know what others are talking about? Think about how you might tell someone about a new pair of shoes. You'd probably name the color. You might describe the structure of the shoe. Maybe you would describe this, the function. You could mention all three white high top basketball shoes. There are a lot of shoes that match this description, so you might mention the size and brand to be more specific. Scientists classify living things in a similar way. Each animal, plant, and other living thing is classified and named according to characteristics they share with others of its species. Living things, or organisms, can be classified in many different ways. Aristotle was one of the first to create a logical and regular way of naming living things. He put 500 organisms into categories based on structure and behavior. Later, animals were sorted in a number of not-so-scientific ways, wild or domesticated, land-dwelling or water-dwelling, large or small, even handsome or not. Creating our system today, Carl von Linné devised a system of organizing and classifying the world's living things. His system did such a good job that it's still widely used and understood today, more than 300 years after his birth. You will read more about von Linné and his work later in this paper. Scientists still discover new species, which makes it difficult to classify living things. These new species don't always fit with the current system. Plus, technology has changed the way we understand living things. For example, all forms of life in the entire world were once placed in either the animal or the plant kingdom. Bacteria and fungi were considered plants. Single-celled organisms that conducted photosynthesis were classified as plants. Organisms that did not were thought of as animals. In 1969, a five kingdom classification system was proposed and later adopted by most biologists. This new system placed bacteria and fungi in their own kingdoms and the single celled organisms we now know as protists make up the fifth kingdom. A few years later though, new research placed humans, plants and fungi into the same category called a domain. Because there are so many undiscovered and unnamed organisms, some people think we shouldn't limit the living things on earth to any set categories. In this issue of Science Studies Weekly Endeavor, you will learn more about the traditional way of classifying the Earth's living things and the reasons of rethinking that system. You will conduct investigations to help understand why classifying organisms can be hard. What names do scientists use for cougars and dandelions? A cougar is a puma concolor to a zoologist and a botanist, or one that studies pl plants, calls a dandelion a teres... Terrazacum officinal <clears throat> biography. Curiosity solves a mystery. Do you remember reading about Alfred Wegener and his idea there was once a supercontinent called Pangaea? Okay, so supercontinent, Pangaea. Pangaea is an important word, um, name, and vocabulary term to know. That's uh, the belief that all continents were one huge continent. Um, that's why it's called the supercontinent. Um, so Pangaea is how you say that. Okay, you, you wanna highlight that. Many people disagreed with Alfred's idea of continental drift. They didn't understand what would cause continents to move. Thanks to Frederick J. Vine, we now have evidence that this really did happen. Frederick Vine was born in England in 1939. He became interested in geology, the study of rocks, when he was 15. In school, he read about how scientists believed that South America and Africa were once connected, but they couldn't prove it. Have you noticed the continents look like puzzle pieces? Frederick decided to learn more about continental drift. After many years of hard work, Vine and a scientist named Drum Matthews were able to provide evidence of continental drift. They did this by showing how the bottom of the ocean spreads apart, causing ridges to form. When these ridges form, the minerals and the rocks are magnetized in the direction of Earth's magnetic field. The magnetic force pushed the continents apart. Vine is still studying the history of Earth. His successful career all began with reading and curiosity. 
next time you're reading and you ask why, it just may lead to an amazing discovery. Classifying creatures with taxonomy. So that pyramid there, um, you're going to hear me say this many, many times because at some point you will have to memorize this for biology, I promise you. So we have a domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And you can see um, each category gets more and more specific. So domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Classifying creatures with taxonomy. Taxonomy is the science of classifying living things. Taxonomists have attempted to classify not only living things, but also chemicals and rocks, among other things. Let's look at the most familiar way of classifying the life on this planet. Kingdoms. The five kingdoms of living things are plants, animals, fungi, protists, and monera. The living things in each of those kingdoms have characteristics in common that make them different from organisms in other kingdoms, but there are significant differences within each kingdom too. Organisms are then divided into groups or smaller levels with more similar characteristics. Let's have a look at the five kingdoms. Plants are multicellular organisms that make their own food through photosynthesis. The kingdom plantae includes flowering plants like dandelions and cone-bearing trees like firs. There are also mosses and ferns that produce spores. Plants come in many sizes, from duckweed, the smallest flowering plant, 3 millimeters in diameter, to the giant sequoia redwood, 115 meters tall. Ferns. I don't trust them. There's something shady about them. Animals are multicellular organisms that get their energy by eating other organisms. So plants make their own food through the photosynthesis. Animals have to eat something else. The kingdom Animalia is divided into two groups, those with backbones, vertebrates, and those without, invertebrates. Invertebrates include insects, sponges, coral, worms, and spiders. Vertebra vertebrates would include birds, lizards, fish, elephants, and you. The kingdom fungi consists of single-celled and multicellular organisms that reproduce by spores. They get their energy by using enzymes to digest food outside their bodies. Then they absorb the simpler molecules. Multicellular fungi include mushrooms and puffballs. Yeast and some molds are common types of unicellular fungi. Protists include single-celled organisms and, and some simple multicellular organisms. Some, like the paramecium and amoeba, get their energy by feeding on other organisms like animals do. Other members of the kingdom, protista, like euglena or the many-celled algae, get their energy through photosynthesis. Still, others obtain energy in a way similar to fungi. Bacteria are the only members of the kingdom Monera, but they are very numerous. These single-celled organisms have no true nucleus. So if you remember, the nucleus is the center of an atom. Most feed off other organisms, but some make their food through photosynthesis. Bacteria are classified according to shapes. Groups. Every kingdom is further divided into groups that decrease in size but increase in how closely related the members are. The next level of grouping is called a phylum. Kingdom, domain first, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And you really have to bop your head with the beat for it because it'll help you. <laughs> Phyla are then divided into classes which are divided into orders. The diagram shows. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Again, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. You guys miss me, I know it. Let's take a look at how this works with the cougar or the mountain lion or, well, you get it. It's an animal and it has a backbone. So the cougar's in the kingdom Animalia and the phylum Chordata. Because the cougar nurses its young, it belongs in the class Mammalia. So you recognize the root mammal there. The status is a meat eater, so it places it in the order Carnivora. Here's where carnivores split into cat-like and dog-like superfamilies, which are again divided into families. The cougars of the family Felidae, along with other cats, so see the word like feline, that root. The cat family is divided further into genera, plural of genus. The cougar shares the genus Puma with just one other animal, the jaguarundi. The cougar is the only member of, of the cone color species. So that's where Puma, cone color, the last two um, pieces of that organization. Classification system. Here we are. Notice the genus name and the species name are italicized. So always, 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 always the scientific names of things, plants or animals, they are in italics. Notice the genus name is capitalized. So that first word is capitalized, but the species is not. And again, that's for every Latin name. 
scientific name of all the things. First one's capitalized, always in italics, second one lowercase. This is the accepted way to list an organism's name. The cougar is Puma concolor, the jaguarundi is Puma jaguarundi, jaguarundi, or something like that. This naming system is known as binomial nomenclature, so classification with the Latin names binomial nomenclature. It was developed by Carl von Linné, and if you glance at the bottom, um, he's coming up again too, so he's an important person this week for sure. This universal code was adopted by scientists in 1902 and has been, wide, been used widely since. Every organism in the world that's been discovered has a scientific name based on this system. A house mouse is mus musculus. It sounds way muscular than mouse should, but hey. A white oak tree is Caracas alba. A type of bacteria that's sometimes used to make yogurt is lactobacillus acetophilus. So you see like lacto like lactose, things in dairy products. You and all other humans are homo sapiens. The classification system is neat and fairly simple, but it has flaws. When many of the Earth's organisms were classified years ago, there was little understanding of evolution and no knowledge of what DNA can tell us. Instead, organisms were grouped according to anatomy. All carnivores, for example, have specialized teeth for feeding. It seems simple enough, but some organisms have been grouped together even though they share only one feature. When you think of sloths, anteaters, aardvarks, and armadillos, what do they have in common? They once belonged to the order Endentata mammals that have no front incisors or molars. The problem is their similarity stops with teeth. These animals have little else in common and are now classified into different orders and families. So the things in order again, we have domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. The system always also needs to expand to accommodate species that do not fit neatly into other places. We now have orders and super orders, classes and infra classes and species and subspecies. As new organisms are discovered, taxonomists may need to further divide the groups into even smaller and more specific groups. With new technology and discoveries, scientists now have different ideas about how organisms should be classified. Some think that they should be classified by how they evolved. For example, the molecular structure of the elephant shrew, a small mouse-like animal, has more in common with elephants than to other shrews. It's crazy. In the 70s, a new division of living things was introduced, the domain. This is the broadest taxonomic category, kingdom is second. Scientists found there are two very different types of organisms found in the kingdom Monera. Under careful, careful study, it was revealed that these two similar groups of unicellular organisms, now called bacteria and archaea, are no more alike than, for example, a dog and a mushroom. After studying the evolution of the organism, scientists separated the organisms into three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Humans fit in the domain eukarya with all other animals, but so do plants, fungi, and protists. On the bottom, we have science tools. Um, using this key, asking the questions one through nine, um, you can kind of like use it to, you know, play a game. If you answer a question, it'll tell you to go to a different question after that to identify something. So it's kind of cool. In the spotlight, Carolus Linnaeus, also known as Carol von Linné. He is from the 1700s. He was a Swedish botanist, zoologist, and physician who developed the classification system of binomial nomenclature used widely today. So backing up here, Carolus and Linnaeus, and then it starts saying Carl von Linné. Um, I believe they explain, yes, they explain <clears throat> soon why it's two different names, but the same guy. Botanist is a scientist of plants, zoologist studies animals, and a physician is like a doctor. Latin became the language of classification. Linné even used the Latin version of his own name, Carolus Linnaeus, and the reason that they use the Latin language is because it's what is called a dead language. People don't use it day to day anymore, just for um, very specific things like science, so there isn't um, slang. So there's different things. I'm trying to think of a... Oh my gosh, I'm so old I can't think of any current slang right now. Um, like, I don't know the oh my word if I say like oh chill like chill out like calm down um <clears throat> originally chill meant like cold right or cool so like temperature not necessarily 
behavior or feelings or, or whatever, that kind of thing, like calm down. Um, so something as simple as, oh, chill, like they wouldn't necessarily get it in a different language. So if you, if you just all use Latin, it doesn't change because the only reasons they use it, um, there's no slang in. So Carol von Linné published his 14 page Systema Natura in 1735, which explained his classification method. By the 12th edition, this book included three volumes and 2,300 pages. Eventually he named or recorded 13,000 species of plants and animals. His work wasn't the largest, but it brought consistency, order, and simplicity to the process of taxonomy. His work wasn't perfect. He established three kingdoms, Animalia, Veg Veget oh my word, Vegetabalia, and Mineralia. There were, they were further divided into classes, orders, genera, and species. We, we now know that minerals are not living things. Linnaeus's taxonomy was brilliant at times. For instance, he saw that whales belonged with other land animals land mammals in an order called quadrupia, now known as mammalia. Today we understand that whales did descend from four-footed animals. This week's question, hybrids. What is a species? Organisms of the same species share, uh, okay, sorry, I was like, I thought this was about hybrid, it is, share similar physical characteristics and can mate, producing offspring of their own kind. Sounds simple, right? Hardly. It's easy to see that a male tiger and female tiger are of the same species. Their offspring will be one or more tiger cubs. However,